Hello everybody, this is Lou White and on your left is Dan Lechendro. Well, let's get started, Dan. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Lou. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Oh, that's good. Yes. Yeah, last time we talked, we uh, I mentioned a couple little things and uh, we got to talking about this and, and uh, you asked me if I could jot down what I remembered from this conversation that I had with this fellow and, and um, so I did the best I could. And it's been, uh, it's been a couple of three years from this point back when I first uh, talked to this gentleman. But uh, I'll just, I just jotted this down, but I'll read it to you the way I wrote it. Okay, um, this first sentence here is something that, that you wrote, Lou, and uh, I was in one of your books. I don't remember which one it was. It was a recent one, though. And it goes like this. Each one of us interact with others who need something from us. We either help them, ignore them, or push them down lower. And I took that and I sort of used that as a springboard here. And I wrote the rest of this. Many need to fill an emptiness within them. They are searching, but do not know where to look. They seek out sources or people they think can help them escape their misery. I have found that for some, to admit their needfulness would be seen by others as weakness and therefore be rejected or made fun of. It's up to us as representatives, or better yet, as vessels, for Yahushua to work through to reach these people. I had an encounter some years ago with a man who was struggling with an addiction to alcohol. He told me that he, that he knew that he had hurt people that cared about him many times, but could not seem to control himself. The feelings of worthlessness and despair were overwhelming, and the only way he knew how to cope was to use the numbing effect of alcohol. Even though he was told repeatedly by some that he was cared about and loved, it didn't seem to be genuine. I suspected that he had some experience at a point in his life that left uh, basically uh, uh, a mark on his subconscious mind, even if it's blocked from memory. I purposely did not mention this in our conversation, and I mostly listened and let him speak. He told me he's attending AA meetings, and it helps, but it's short-lived. Being encouraging, I said it was definitely a step in the right direction, but you will never find what you truly need there to overcome your affliction. While being taught to give your problem over to your, quote, higher power, sounds reasonable and good. It is both misleading and impersonal, and there is no power other than that of the human spirit, and that really doesn't help in the long run. There is one, however, that can heal you of your affliction. He knows everything about you, including the number of hairs on your head. He knew you before you were born and when you are going to die. And here's the best part. He wants you to find him, and he's not that far off. He's very near. The age-old question is still being asked, why am I here? The answer is so simple that it is overlooked by practically everyone. Simply put, it is to learn how to love one another, our creator first, then our fellow man. The one who has created us in his image has first loved us with an everlasting love that surpasses all time and comprehension. He gave his life freely for us. So, for the feelings of worthlessness and despair that you shared with me, are being put into your mind by the enemy of souls who wants you to be in the state that you're in. Now, I want you to think about this. These thoughts that are being put in your mind, can you control them? Can you stop them? No? Why not? Would it be then that they are being manifested by a, quote, higher power than you? You see where I'm going with this, don't you? There are all kinds of higher powers out there. If you stick your finger in a live light socket, you're going to get knocked on your butt. So even that could be a higher power. He laughed when I said that. Mm -hmm. So now, wouldn't it be much better to seek him that can heal you instead of listening and following the ideas and philosophies of men? The one that is has a name. Only one name, not many names like religions teach. And that name is Yahuwah. Very simple to grasp, just four Hebrew vowels, very easy to sound off. He says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So then, call on his name for help. Learn the Ten Commandments. Live by them. 
they're way better than the 12 steps. And they lead to life, and that life is more abundant. I'll talk to you again, and I hope what I said helps you see things clearer and gives you a perspective that you've not had. He wanted me to speak at a group meeting, but I said that one-to-one is less distracting and more effective because there's order and communication is better. Sometimes in groups, especially where there is a leader, there can be an agenda. And, of course, the clock on the wall can be a distraction to some. He understood my position. And I've only seen him once since then, but did not have an opportunity to talk with him. But by appearances, he seems better. And I'm sure I'll run into him again at some point and see how he's doing. So that's uh, basically the sum and substance of it. And uh, I hope he's doing better. Yeah, I think a lot of people would relate to what you just said. I can only hope. Yes, indeed. Yes, we all have baggage and things that we remember from our past. And we're not that person. We're not looking back. We're looking forward to a wedding that we're going to have with our Mashiach, Yahusha, when he comes. And uh, Exactly. Yep. In this video, I wanted to make people think about reading... Zechariah chapter 14 and Zechariah and Daniel chapter 12 and why not read Zechariah 12 and Matthew Mat Matthew who are Matthew 24 and Yashiyahu or Isaiah 24 and think about the end times of the world order and the beast you know what the beast is what it, how they're controlling history and they think they're in charge of the universe, but the one that is in charge of the universe, you know, re it reminds me of a book that I'm working on right now <coughs> called The Tetragrammaton. And uh, that name, he, they've been fighting it since the beginning. Even, Nim even Nimrod didn't like it. He fought against it. And the world order ever since has been fighting it. But it's the most amazing name in the entire universe. And it's, it's about to unleash all over the planet. But uh, we're on the first day of Sukkah today, Dan. Yes, we are. And, uh, yeah. That's uh, a, uh, a reflection of what's coming. The real one's coming. Yes, yes. The household that he's prepared for us. The barn, mm -hmm. in some places it says, after the weeds are removed, then the same messengers that were sent to burn them gathers the wheat in that order and into his barn. He's the gardener. That's right. So, uh, you know, Sukkoth yes. is amazing. It just teaches you so much year by year. Well, as time passes and we practice it each year, it, it gives our um, understanding a yeah. little more clarity of what's actually going to happen. And that's something that uh, that Christians are really missing out on. Yeah. They're because they they basically have uh, been taught that these appointed times have been uh, done away with, nailed to the stake, mm -hmm. and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, there's just shadows of things to come, and. You know, they help us to better understand the events when they do happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would behoove us then to do the best we can to understand these. And there's something that you wrote in uh, in the book, uh, Babylon Has Fallen, mm -hmm. kind of caught my eye. It was uh, had to do with uh, Matty Yahoo 24, 20. And uh, Yahushua told us not to dream of the great distress in the last days and that we pray that our flight not in the winter or on a Sabbath day. Well, the viruses are mutating. The birth pangs will only become more severe from this point. Christians may think we are cruel to expose the truth about their adoption of pagan practices. Mm -hmm. But we have to say something. Unless every person repents, they'll perish. Yes, Yahoo, Isaiah 24, Malachi 4, they're not written down for us to ignore. Yahushua is at the door about to bring Babel's reign to an end. He uses pestilence to bring repentance. Remember 2 Chronicles 7, 13-22. His people know his name, 
and our seals as his for the catastrophic days ahead. The reapers will remove the weeds first, but not harm the wheat. Yes, that's a direct uh, truth that comes from Scripture's teachings. But that's not what they teach. They teach that uh, he was born and the messenger sang from the skies. The sky lit up and the messengers were there announcing his birth to the shepherds. <laughs> and, they, mm -hmm. what? and they were hearing such beautiful music and the announcement of the message. And they were told to go and look for him in a specific place and the sign of him, their correct person, would be uh, a signal to them that he would be lying in a manger and wrapped in the cloths that were thrown out by the priests and swaddling clothing. And mm -hmm. uh, they went and, 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 but Christianity thinks that it was the middle of the winter, or, you know, back there uh, in December, uh, the shepherds were watching their flocks by night and uh, there's no way they would be out there with that those temperatures and but no. but Sukkoth was the first the first day of Sukkoth which is today was the same point that he was born and Sukkoth itself means a temporary dwelling exactly and mm -hmm. then the eighth day of this uh, period is the day that he was circumcised mm -hmm. it was a like a new beginning, so he fulfilled the, the, the covenant that was required for him to fulfill all righteousness, as they say. But uh, the old covenant, though, they, they have such misunderstanding about that. You know, the festivals are, are part of a bigger plan that is about redemption. But uh, the temporary redemption of animal blood that's the old covenant written on a scroll hung beside the ark. That's the old covenant, Deuteronomy 31 26. Mm -hmm. yep. But uh, they're, they're taught to stay away. There was a, an article that I had where I, 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 uh, I thought it was very apropos, something that we would maybe, I've forgotten what the title of the article was, but. Anyway, it's, it's about the way that Christians have, all their denominations have taught them to stay away from that, those commandments, and yet they require a tithe. They're teaching to, to tithe to them, but they want you to not obey the commandments, and that doesn't make any sense. No. You're just feeding a beast, you know. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like pick and choose what you want to believe, and it's yeah. like that that's not that's not going to work, you know. That's yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't. No. Well, Malachi four talks about you know remember the Torah of Moshe. Right. You know, laws and right ruling. And there's a a, a little track that we have that you can pick up called Seventh Day Shabbat Mark. There's a mark on this that we obey the, the seventh day and then of course the festivals which are on, on page two and the intervals that we obey. Who it was that changed everything and that would be Constantine and he, he, he started the Roman circus. The Edict of Constantine. Uh, and then I wanted to read this one little passage that makes it very interesting. Let's see. Um, Yahushua's bride. Who is that? Well, it would be, have to be the, the ones that he is coming back to, his inheritance. We are his inheritance. The bride is obedient, and she's preparing herself. Okay. Here is our warning before the day of Yahuwah. Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael. Laws and right rulings. See, I am sending you Aliyahu, the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. 
He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. That's Malachi 4, verses 4 through 6. Who understands this? The Torah of Moshe is the very thing most are told to avoid. And all we hear is legalism when obedience is mentioned. What if we were to be found obeying his commandments when he returns? How tragic could it be? Obedience is the fruit that he is looking for, especially so from his bride. She may have many spots and wrinkles, but she is preparing herself for her bridegroom. That's this article, the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath mark, Shabbat mark. Yeah. You know, one of the things Yahushua said to his Talmudim, because when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will he find belief? Mm. And he's not talking about the belief in the Greek sense of the form. He's talking about belief in the Hebrew sense, which includes obeying. Yes. Give the Torah some and legs. Make it happen. Yeah, and that's <laughs> what Christianity is, is missing. Oh, Seriously. Yeah. That's it. Well, the video is uh, just about long enough for us to do something with now, so I think I'll stop it here. Did you have any closing words that you thought were important to say? Um, dwell on that thought about Malachi 4, it's about the, remembering yeah. the Torah of Moshe. Yeah, it's that the was the crazy. last warning that we got, and then there was a 400-year silence. Sometimes the last thing you hear a person say is ringing in your ears. And that's kind of what happened. Well, thank you Silence. all for watching. Silence is deafening. Yes. Well, thank you, Dan. And thank all of you for watching, watching this. And please like and subscribe. Talk to you all next time. Bye.
Well, let's see. What do we want to do here? I guess we want to do this. 